Welcome back. So last week, the principal deck beams were riveted together. And this week, Thad Danielson is back to help Steve finish installing the shelf and also to go over the plans to see precisely where we want all of it to go. There's some big considerations here that will affect the usage of Arabella, so we're going to take a little extra time today to make sure it's done right. So Thad is back today, hello Thad, and he brought a tool, a tool that I don't own that's going to prove to be very useful today. <laughs> so what you got there? This is a power compass plane with the adjustable bed. So you can uh, plane out concave and convex surfaces. So yesterday I riveted the deck beams together. And you can see the inside face here from the being cut with the bandsaw just needs to be fared out a bit. And this is the perfect tool. So what Thad's saying here is the sole on this can go up and can go down. I have an old manual version of one of these, but with these being together, the grain is going to run different ways and it's going to make hand planing it very challenging. Where this thing won't really care too much about the grain direction. So, Thad yeah. is going to rip through these for me, and then I'm going to sand them down and we can put coats of finish. I'm going to blast you. <laughs> All right. I'm ready. Yeah, much better than before. Doing things a little out of order here, but it's kind of the way the cookie crumbled. Once I got the deck beams riveted together, the next thing they needed was to have a power plane run down the inside and fare them out. So the logical step would have been to power plane them, sand them, seal them, varnish them, put them on top of the shelf, get all that clamped together, fasten the shelf, fit the deck beams, do the last little bit of touch up on the ends of them where we fit them to the uh, shelf, and continue. Um, but to do that, I would have had to have Thad come yesterday, power plane them, and then send them packing. And he would have been here for like half an hour. And I didn't really want to do that. So Thad power plane them, I worked on sanding them, and he got the shelf all clamped into the boat while I was sanding. And then we took the deck beams, we put them on top of the shelf, clamped the shelf into place, and we worked on getting that fastened. 
So Thad and I got the port side all fastened yesterday and that took us right around four hours. It's amazing how long it takes just to get everything clamped right where you want it and then to drill down between each frame and put in the screws and then to drill through the shelf and counter bore and put the bolts in it just takes a long time. So if we did like one, two, three, four carriage bolts and we could throw a couple yeah. Intermediate screws yeah. in there. Yeah. Oh, wow. But the other ones are just going yeah, through. I understand. Yeah. You know, an inch shorter, an inch and a half on it. don't believe me when I tell them the bit and brace has more power than the impact gun or the drill. <laughs> We got the port side all done and then Thad took off and then I rallied and started onto the starboard and I got all the screws put in and then I went back this morning and drilled and put in a bunch of the bolts. I ended up about 10, 12 bolts shy for bolting the shelf through the frames. Uh, not a big deal, I ordered some more. We can uh, leave some clamps in there for now. So that's all set. The shelf is now in other than those couple bolts but they're drilled counterboard. Once the bolts get here it'll take me half an hour to put them all in. Uh, so I pulled the deck beams back out of the boat and now I'm going to give them a wipe down with a scotch Brite pad and then a wipe with denatured alcohol and then I've got to seal these faces that we uh, fared and then we can start putting some varnish on them. The only faces on the deck beams that are sealed so far are the outside faces and that's because I wanted some sealant underneath the washers for the uh, rivets. So I put two coats of sealer on the outside faces and put the rivets through. <clears throat> now I'll put the two coats of sealer on the inside face here and then I can varnish all three faces and the top one that'll get dealt with later when the deck gets fared out. And as you can see I'm a little ways from the boathouse here. I'm up on the hill. Maybe you can hear the roosters crowing in the background. <laughs> uh, and the reason for that is I'm underneath the shade of these maple trees which might mean that some leaves and things could drop in the varnish, which might be a pain, but it's supposed to be really bright and sunny today. And I want to keep working in the boathouse and I can't have the varnish drying up there and me moving around making dust. And if I put the deck beams in the sun, the varnish is going to kick way too quickly and it's going to be a real pain trying to put it on. So hence underneath the trees. So I'm going to get these wiped down and start getting the sealer coats on them and just be bouncing back and forth for today between working on things in the boathouse and getting coats of sealer on these and hopefully tomorrow uh, my friend Satchel will be here and we're going to look at where exactly these, these need to land in the boat and get all of that situated and hopefully start bolting them in. So in my mind, for the deck beams, we would start with the main mast because that's the most gospel and put a deck beam immediately fore and aft of it. The hatch could move a little bit, the house could move a little bit, and then the mizzen, that's the other one. See how he has these beams, basically deck beams underneath right. the cockpit? Right. And then this weird cockpit's all beams. box here that's, that's the, that's the uh, mizzen rides in. That's the bridge deck. Here. Yeah. Yeah. 
So why not just step the mast on deck here? Why not? Mask, yeah. Right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> this is the fun thing with these plans. Well, this is this is the way with boat plans of any kind. I mean, in Atkins, a lot of them are a little strange, but uh, but the fact that you don't get any almost any details twice. Yeah. <laughs> no matter, you know, I mean, there's there's specification lists and there's plans and if you have a specification list and if you have something listed in it it won't be shown in the plans yep and if you have something written in the plans it won't be in the specification list well yeah that's what I had with the headers you have to go all you have to go back and forth and around and around to make sure you see every detail yeah I was reading the, uh, the spec list and it says there's headers at the way of every hatch and you look here and he doesn't he doesn't have them in. Right. It's, it's, it's all, it's the way. It's a very uh, interesting. Naval architects just want to make sure you're up to it, huh? Right. <laughs> I've kind of been thinking that from from here back, we're just kind of kind of redesign that a little more yeah. in line with how I've seen it traditionally done. Right. And I've, I mean, I've looked at a lot of boat plans and write a lot of boat building books, and I have never seen the cockpit set up that way. I'm sure you probably have, but... No. No, you haven't. No. <laughs> well, Victoria set up that way? No. Right. No, huh? But she was a cutter. She didn't have so a mission. she only had the, yeah, main... Well, oh, she didn't have a mission. Yeah. Right. Okay. She just had the one up here, which is the same way. It went through the deck and was stepped right on the forefoot like that. Sure. Right. That makes sense, yeah. So I was kind of thinking of figuring out the deck beams for the main mast, figuring out how to set up the mizzen mast, and then probably figuring out the house and the cockpit. The aft hatch, the deck beams aren't even cut for it yet. No worries about that. And then the fore hatch. Yeah, and then like, I don't know, the forward hatch, I kind of want to like figure out where the mast is going to be and then maybe clamp the Samson post in place and maybe go grab the windlass and throw it behind the Samson post and just see how all of that feels. Yeah. Here's 40 pounds of bronze. I'm thinking about working the hat and working the windlass. Yeah. So I'm just trying to imagine. If I can not take a header into the boat. Don't do that. You know, you'd be sitting here and the hatch would be right behind you. And the hatch is 24 inches square. Right. Yeah. So what I'm wondering is like, there's plenty of room aft. Exactly. You just bring the hatch back a little bit. Something like that. And then we gain quite a bit more room here up on the fore deck to work the windlass. All right. Thad came by this morning and we looked at the plans and talked about the deck structure and some different options. Some of the way Atkins had it drawn, some of the ways that other people have done it, uh, and just kind of figuring out what Atkin wanted and, and maybe what's the best way for us to continue and to frame out the deck in Arabella. So right now what we have are all of the strong deck beams. So these are all doubled up, they're twice as thick as a normal deck beam would be. And these are in the way of the masts and any of the housetop openings. So, or any deck openings. So these forward two here, these frame out the uh, forward hatch. And then these two are gonna be on either side of the mast. This string is the center line of where the mast is gonna come through the deck. The next one back is the forward end of the house. And then in the stern, there's the aft end of the house. There's the support for the mizzen mast. And then there's two heavy beams for the cockpit. Uh, so we got these kind of laid out, <clears throat> and what we've been playing with 
is just moving them fore and aft ever so slightly. Uh, we're talking a matter of inches to figure out <clears throat> where it makes the most sense for being able to put in hanging knees, which are gonna vertically connect our framing with our decking and add a lot of rigidity there and where the openings are gonna be. So for instance, right here is where we have the opening for the forward hatch. <clears throat> and looking at the plans, we decided to move it aft about six or eight inches. And the reason for that is that it puts the hatch a bit more over the forepeak, which would be the living quarters up there, which would be nice. It gives you a bit more room on the foredeck when you're working on the windlass. You can see that we drag the windlass out and have the Samson post kind of thrown in there, just getting an idea of what it would feel like to work on deck. And having the house a little bit closer to the main mast shouldn't really be an issue. There's plenty of room on both sides of the main mast to do any work. Uh, so we thought that moving it back made a little bit of sense. And same thing with the house. I think the aft end got pushed aft a little bit, and the forward end, I think, also got pushed aft a little bit. Like I said, just to make it easier with lining up with knees on the frames and that kind of thing. And none of these are major changes. And if you look at the plans, Atkin has them drawn for the gaff rig and for the Bermudan. Uh, the Bermudan was drawn, I think, in 34, and the gaff in 56, I think, something like that. Um, and he changed the house and he changed some of the deck between those two designs. Uh, the house top's a little bit different. And a lot of that, it, it really just kind of boils down to cosmetics and use of the boat. Uh, structurally, it, you know, if the hatch is a few inches one way or the other, it's not going to make a difference. But when you're working on the windlass, maybe you really will wish that that hatch was six inches back. And that's the kind of thing that we were trying to figure out. Uh, so with Thad's help, I feel like I got that pretty much under control. We know where everything needs to land. Uh, so now I'm going to go through and get these fastened. They still have to come out. I still have to uh, seal and varnish them. But I'm on a little bit of a time crunch. Uh, I have a friend who lives on the West Coast who's on the East Coast for this week. And I really want his opinion on how to do the housetop. And I really want his help with mocking that up and seeing what that looks like. So before we can mock the housetop up, it means that these beams need to come out. And for these beams to come out, I need to bolt in the deck beams. Uh, and like I said, I'm a little bit of a time crunch. So what my thought process here is, I'm going to go through and bolt the deck beams in. And there are way more deck beams than there are braces. So after I work with Satchel and we kind of get the house top mocked up and we feel good about that, I can come in and probably take out half of these beams, varnish them, finish them up, put them back in, take out the other half and do it. So it really won't be a big deal. And I'm also just super anxious to see what the deck looks like. <laughs>
these deck beams are ridiculous. What do you mean? Just how much span there is and how stiff they are. It's incredible. The locust is. Yeah. And like I said, they're all they're all sawn out of like really good sweeps. The grain yeah. pretty much follows. Them. Yeah, no, it's pretty incredible. <laughs> and then one and a half inch decking goes on top of that. Dude, you're... Oh, somebody should make like a series of jokes. Hey, have you heard about Acorn to Arabella? Yeah, they sailed in there on an iceberg and the iceberg broke. <laughs> hey, <laughs> they hit a rock and they bounced off. <laughs> It's like Chuck Norris. Yeah, it's basically... They, they, they hit the rock and the earth moves. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you know what's wild? Right now, she has that one post of the stem screwed in. Yeah. And she's got these two boards attached to the shear bands mm. out to the frames. Yeah. That's it. There's no oh. blocking or bracing underneath or anything. Yeah. She's just sitting here. I mean... It's so hard for our minds to conceive how center of gravity works. I literally did calculations for a like 180 foot long dry dock caisson that we were building that had a bunch of concrete ballast in it. And it was like, you can pick it up and put it on a transporter and basically not attach it. Like you can just put it down and it will not, like you can drive it around and it will not follow. But you would have to tip 13 degrees before the center of gravity got you know, started. Yeah. We put it on a barge. I think we had a thousand tons. We put it on a barge, and we attached like some small braces to the lower part of the barge. It's <laughs> 60 feet tall. Uh, yeah. Shipped it from Virginia up to Maine. It's, it, I, I can't wrap my head around it. This feels. A little bit better than I think the 29 inch belt, what I'm remembering since the Victorian. It was like you were like that. It was close. Knee to knee. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think this is good because we can both be here, right? We're awkwardly a little close, but who cares? Yeah. And then, yeah, you sit back and lean back against the coming a little bit. Yeah. Seeing you could have. Or even five people in the cockpit. Yeah. Well, the nice thing, the good thing about the small cockpit is, so what are we doing? We're either up here sailing or we're hanging out or we're eating. So the nice thing is, like, everybody is within arm's reach. Nobody has to get up to yeah. get anything. You're just like, oh. Can you hand this to me? Yeah. Here you go. Yeah. Which is, that was the one thing about the tiny interior on the last boat I was on, it was great, because once you had like four people down there, no one had to get up. You could reach out all the different storage areas. Yeah, this feels good, and actually, I'm pretty okay with the bridge deck, because, so, I guess one thing is, let's look at the deck over here, right? Like, what, what kind of... The Victorious was... A I think it was too 11, shallow. 12, call it 12. Yeah. Yeah, Just 12 below the deck beam or 12 below the deck? Alright, it would have been 12 from the top yeah. of the deck. 14, 16, I think 18 would be too much. Yeah, 18 does feel a little bit like you're deep, deep down in there. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, call it 22 inches above the engine beds for wiggle room. Should be enough. Oh, that's it? According to this, yeah. If I'm reading this right. Oh my. Like Three and an eighth. Yeah. Plus. Plus the 15 and yeah. seven eighths. And then we gotta add a little more to the high rise. It's nice that the engine's got smaller. Yeah. 15. Have you ever heard of a boat called the Portland Pudgy? The Portland Pudgy? The yeah. Portland Pudgy. Okay, I want you to research the Portland Pudgy. Okay. My friend Andrew told me about it. We were talking about tenders and lifeboats mm, and all yeah, of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And his argument was that life rafts suck. On like okay. many, many levels. 
for many reasons. Okay. Just hear me out. Yeah. So he was a big advocate of your tender also being capable of being your lifeboat. Okay. And there is this boat that has been made in Maine called Portland Pudgy, and that is exactly what it is designed as. It is a unsinkable tender slash lifeboat. Um, it's got a storm cover that goes over it and everything. It's got sails. There's all different packages that you can get with it. Um, and it's, it's made to be an offshore lifeboat. So, I want to make the tender out of the cedar and the mahogany that I salvaged from Victoria. Mm -hmm. I want to strip build, epoxy, glass it because I intend to beat the living piss out of it. And I'm wondering if I could make it, modify it, do it in a way that it would suffice as a lifeboat and not have to have a lifeboat. A lifeboat. Well, you don't have to have one. Well, but, yes. But. In any story that I've ever read about people getting caught in life rafts and stuff, like, if you have, if your EPIRB works and all of that goes well and they come pick you up pretty quick, it's okay. But if you really need to rely on it for a while, it sounds like they are pretty freaking miserable. Uh, certainly. And I mean, they just start to fall apart and they pop and, like, yeah, the, the woman that I sailed with actually spent 24 hours in a life raft off of Hawaii. Uh, they got hit by a whale and it gashed like a, you know, three foot long hole in the bow and the boat went down in 20 minutes. Yeah. So I'm wondering if you could like strip build Faye, but do her, um, my buddy Bob Emser is telling me about this foam that they make that you can do boats with where you just like glass it and the foam is <laughs> yeah so i wonder if i could um you know build up the outside as like a really thin strip build and then put a layer of the foam epoxy on the inside and then a layer of glass over it and just make her you know two inches thick all the way through and through yeah so that the thing was unsinkable and even swamped would float halfway out of the water. Yeah. Um, and then with the sail and the oar rig on it, and some sort of like shelter that you could put over it, I think yeah. that would be far preferable to a life raft. Thanks for joining us today, and we hope that you enjoyed the chance to ponder the possibilities as Arabella starts to take shape as an actual working sailboat. If you follow the project on Instagram, then you probably already know that Steve has been motoring ahead on the deck. So look forward to the mass blocking getting done in next week's episode. Till then. <laughs>